hello everyone. Uh, my name is Anibal Kopol and I work in the Institute of Geophysics, Polish Academy of Sciences. Today we're going to talk about microbial factories, uh, which is basically what we owe to microbes. Some of the things that you probably know already, maybe you're not entirely aware of the mechanism, and some will be probably, hopefully, uh, new uh, uh, for you. So uh, let's start with the fact that actually every cell is a factory. Every cell in our body, every living cell is a factory. And um, if we think about parts of um, living cell as elements of factory, we can uh, easily uh, find, find similarities. So uh, we have like nucleus, it's like a person in charge, controls the cell function, so CEO maybe. Uh, so it contains DNA, and the DNA is like a master organizing how the whole cell works. So let's say it's a management, the highest management. Uh, what else do we have? Mitochondria. Mitochondria, mitochondria are like the batteries, batteries in every cell, in your cell. So uh, there are chemical reactions that create energy that powers all the functions. So it's the the place where power is, is uh, created. Uh, what else do we have? Like lysosomes. Um, and lysosomes are like little sacs and they like a waste disposal system. And um, if you imagine a Pac-Man, I'm not sure if kids still play Pac-Man, uh, but Pac-Man this, was this little arcade game with a tiny head, tiny character, eating everything uh, on its way. So it's like, like a Pac-Man. Uh, it leaves some, eat like bacteria, all the unwanted material in the cell, and they digest it and make it, make it harmless. So it's like a waste disposal or like a janitor, like a cleaning system, uh, maybe. Um, what else do we have? Um, ribosomes. Uh, they're like molecule makers, so they produce, they assemble proteins and they use this print that is DNA, that is in management, in nucleus, and they produce the product, the uh, proteins. Uh, there are others like uh, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and other which is also uh, essential for production of proteins, of lipids, fats. Oh, the Golgi apparatus is, is quite interesting. Um, it's, like, it's like a belt in a factory. So uh, it takes proteins, it takes the product, and it and it kind of um, wraps it, uh, wraps it into uh, packaging, we must say, and the final product is shipped out of the cell. So this is like. Um, uh, shipping center maybe. So each tiny, uh, each of trillions and trillions and trillions and billions of cells is, is such factory. And um, as you know, we depend on microbes heavily and each organism, and also human organism, has a, its own microbiome. And uh, hello, uh, hello Albania. <laughs> And the microbiome uh, is very, very important. Actually, we wouldn't be able to live, with, we live without those guests inside us. And there are billions and billions of them. And actually, um, they're crucial for regulation of digestion, of course, but not only digestion. Uh, and based on latest, latest research, um, there is some association uh, between the uh, microbes of lack, lack of microbes and metabolic disorders like obesity, like diabetes, but also our mental health. Possibly some neuropsychiatric psychiatric, uh, disorders like even schizophrenia or maybe even autism, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, even some types of major depression might be associated to our microbiome. So even though they're so, so tiny, they're uh, very important. Uh, and they work for us. 
uh, not only inside our, our bodies, but literally they work for us um, in, in, a, in, in many branches of, of industry. Uh, in, we use them more and more often. So I have a question for you. Here you have main groups of microbes. So you have bacteria, algae, protozoa, fungi, and virus. Protozoa, like amoebs maybe. And uh, which groups you think are used directly by humans? I'm not talking about my, my, our microbiome. I'm, uh, I'm talking about those microbial factories, that is actual industrial uh, use of certain groups of microbes. So, so which one would you say are used? So mostly bacteria and fungi, algae are uh, also used. I'm talking about the production. Of course, we use algae like, um, as a medicine, directly. Medicine or most like, mostly like um, dietary supplement. And protozoa, not so much for now. So bacteria, fungi, and we'll see about some more groups. And why are they so perfect? Why would they always win uh, Employee of the Month uh, award? Uh, well, they're quite cheap. <laughs> That's uh, maybe a sad conclusion, but... Um, Cheap, well, the technology that is used for them is not cheap because it involves lots of laboratory work and um, genetical modification, sometimes, not always, but actually they're quite cheap because they grow or rather they multiply rapidly. So there's lots and lots and lots of them. They're uh, quite easy to maintain. They don't require a lot. They usually have some simple nutrient requirements. So it's easy to feed them. They mostly like sugar. And sugar is always good for them. And we use the fact that they like sugar. And they can be used for a wide range of products, almost unlimited. And uh, well, about those requirements, sometimes they're a little bit more sophisticated or a little bit more extreme, but we'll get to that uh, later. So uh, they're, they're perfect uh, for us. We can multiply them, we can modify them also quite easily. You saw uh, maybe during the movie that we, are, uh, we can um, include fragments of uh, external DNA into uh, bacteria and make it produce something that we want. There were some examples, we'll get to that uh, later. So um, actually we can modify them, we can use them, we can breed them, uh, quite easy to deal with. So the first and the most obvious and the oldest way to use microbes is food. Uh, to produce bread, well not, uh, yeah, bread or, or dal or, or um, all kinds of, or, or this type of, of cakes. Let's start with bread. So for bread, we use yeast. Yeast is a type of fungi. So let's not confuse fungi with, uh, with mushrooms. Mushrooms have a, a tissue and so on, and fungi in this uh, case, like yeast, are monocellular organisms. They look like this. Uh, so bread, we use fungi, yeast. For yogurt, bacteria, for cheese, I mean bacteria and sometimes fungi as, as well, like I mentioned, gorgonzola or um, camembert uh, or other types of, of cheese. Uh, also sauerkraut. Sauerkraut, uh, you know what sauerkraut is? Actually, it comes from German. And uh, in Poland, it, it's very, very popular uh, as a dish, as a side dish maybe. So it's cabbage, it's fermented, uh, fermented cabbage, uh, cabbage. Okay, currently actually there are more than 3,500 traditionally fermented food in the world. Maybe you heard about kimchi, uh, that's a Korean 
type of very spicy sauerkraut. Um, they, are, they can be of animal or vegetable origin and you can meet them all the time in your daily life. Whatever your diet is, even if you're vegetarian or vegan, you still eat some fermented food. Alcoholic drinks for adults uh, are also uh, fermented drinks produced during uh, produced thanks to work of microbes. So um, actually, the first time people realized that microorganisms were involved in food production was in 1837, in 19th century. So this is where when this scientists discovered the role of yeast of those fungi uh, in alcoholic fermentation and production of alcohol, but it was used by humanity since the beginning uh, of time. So in the 19th century, they only understood the process. Uh, later, um, the French chemist and biologist Louis Pasteur was trying to explain what was going on uh, during the production of beer and vinegar, and he found also that microorganisms were responsible. So we understand the process not, not for such a long uh, time. Uh, what you see uh, here is lactobacillus, which is yogurt bacteria. This is how, how yogurt is uh, produced. Uh, and these are some of the uh, characteristics for fermented foods, sauerkraut, um, for example. Uh, these are various types of microbes, um, which are bacteria and fungi, yeast, types of yeast, that are, we might say, agents of uh, fermentation, that they um, are used in fermentation uh, processes to produce some, uh, some food. So I mentioned, so how does it work? Uh, I mentioned the all love sugar and they generally feed on sugar so whenever they find, find sugar they use it for their processes and there are some side side effects side products um, we might say waste products that are very valuable for us like ethanol like carbon dioxide like lactic acid so we get alcohol we get bubbles um, we get uh, we get this specific structure and taste of yogurt, and this is very important that the uh, nutrition, the nutrition characteristics, the um, specifics are better than usually better than those of fresh products. Sauerkraut, for example, is a good source of vitamins and those vitamins are produced are like released you might say from from the fresh product by those microbes folic acid vitamins uh, and so on and so on and um, this plays a giant role uh, in a traditional diet not only uh, sauerkraut but you remember the story about kiviak the kiviak which is quite quite gross dish from European perspective, I believe. It's a traditional Inuit uh, uh, dish, which is made of entire birds, or little ox. So little ox, I will just remind you shortly, are put, of course dead uh, little ox, are put into a seal skin. They are sealed and they are put away for, uh, for some time and they are fermented and uh, they are then eaten, the whole thing is eaten, and it's treated as a delicacy. But also, it's not only a delicacy, why would they do that? Somehow they, they figured out that um, people need vitamins, and uh, in the north there's not a lot of source of vitamins, like berries maybe, no fruits, no vegetables. Of course, they are adapted to different diet a little bit, but uh, humans need vitamins. So this fermented food, which creates, which produces vitamin, uh, vitamins, uh, let them survive. So literally, northern societies uh, owe their survival to the microbes. Uh, of course, um, if you look at those two 
the photos. This is uh, some sort of blue cheese, and this is uh, rotten, um, ro rotten orange. This is basically the same process, but uh, well, more, more or less. We have fungi here, we have bacteria and fungi here. But what we get here is poisonous from human point of view. And what you get here is not dangerous. Well, for most people it's not dangerous and we find it delicious. So uh, the products may be different, but we manage to choose what is uh, beneficial for us. But food is one thing, and it was, um, um, it was used way before people understood how microbes worked or that there were even any microbes involved. It was a little bit like this with pharmaceutics, with medicine, at least in the beginning. Uh, so people uh, were using, like, for example, uh, molded uh, bread. I can still remember some stories from uh, grand, uh, grand, grand, grandmother uh, that people uh, were using bread mixed with spider's net and uh, saliva and they were mixing it and actually it was what was it it was a penicillin they didn't understand how it worked but it created this uh, this uh, this product that we obtain now so uh, what we use um, now um, microbes for in terms of pharmaceutics in it's a very, very important and a very developing, dynamically developing um, discipline. Actually, uh, if you are, if you like biology and if you want to, if you're thinking about your future career, one of my biggest regrets is that I did not choose biotechnology because this is a very developing branch and uh, helps you change humanity and um, in, invent new invent or discover new medicines and fight many diseases so uh, i recommend you to think about biotechnology and so what we uh, what we usually do but not always we modify dna of those microbes uh, it's not always necessary, but we like to do this. We make them more efficient. We make the final product more adapted to our needs, for example. What do we, do we use it for? Antibiotics, vaccines, opioids. Opioids are um, painkillers, very strong painkillers. and They also produce insulin. It was mentioned in the movie. And this is the answer to the question whether we use uh, viruses or not. We do. Uh, we are trying to use them, at least. We are trying to use so-called bacteriophages, which, um, well, like I said, um, we are used to viruses being dangerous and uh, dangerous for humans, like influenza, um, flu, uh, influenza or flu uh, virus, for example. Uh, but those bacteriophages are viruses that only infect and kill some certain bacteria. And that would be a groundbreaking alternative to antibiotics. Uh, they would not only prevent further growth, they would just kill, uh, kill bacteria. So this is one of the future paths of this. What you see here is a um, bacterium. A streptomyces bacterium, and here is the structure of the antibiotic. Antibiotic is here. It is produced by this uh, by this bacterium. So we use the, use them uh, this way. I mentioned about the, the history of antibiotics, and um, you know what the first um, discovered antibiotic was. What was it called like? What was it called? It was actually uh, the name is very similar to the name of the fungus. 
So um, antibiotics, like I said, were used for millennia to treat infections without even knowing it. But people didn't know what they were using. And um, also they didn't have anti antibiotics for all the dangerous diseases. They were using various molds, plant extracts, uh, about this moldy bread, even ancient Egyptians uh, did that. But until the 20th century, they didn't know how it uh, worked uh, exactly. And there were some trials in um, in 19th century. Uh, but actually, uh, this guy here uh, made a giant groundbreaking discovery. And he made this discovery by by accident. This is Alexander Fleming, and actually he was a scientist who's quite um, he was quite disorderly in his work, uh, and he accidentally discovered penicillin. So this is uh, talking uh, talking about having a very clean desk. Uh, it's not always worth to have a totally one hundred percent clean desk. Uh, so he was a little bit disorderly, like I said. He, he had a laboratory. He was doing some research, and uh, in 1928, he went to a holiday and left his work. But then he came back from his holiday, and he noticed that a certain fungus, Penicillinum notatum, had contaminated something. He had a culture of bacteria, Staphylococcus bacteria. Uh, and uh, the, the fungus must have contaminated it by, by accident. By, but, uh, because he left it un uncovered. But where, in the places where the fungus touched the bacteria, um, there were zones where bacteria like was was dead, like disappeared. So uh, Fleming isolated and grew this mold in, in pure culture, and it happened to be very, very extremely effective, even at very low concentration. So when he diluted it like 100, 800 times, it still had these properties to kill bacteria. So this is how the first antibiotic penicillin that literally changed the world was discovered. And insulin was is another groundbreaking, uh, maybe not discovery, but uh, change in um, obtaining uh, a medicine. Uh, as it was mentioned before, uh, it, they used to take insulin, and it is still uh, an ongoing process from pigs, from cows. It was taken from the pancreas. But the insulin wasn't like matching 100%. It was um, the demand is so big that they weren't able to give enough uh, insulin. Um, there are a lot, a lot of people who suffer from diabetes, so they need uh, insulin on a daily basis. So there's a huge demand, and um, so we are now using microbes to produce not a pig or a cow, but human insulin. How do we do this? With using so-called recombinant DNA uh, technology.
I think it's quite well explained. So this is how human uh, insulin is now produced. But the, the process is this very, very precise. You need to cut out the precisely the correct gene and then insert it into the plasmid. And then uh, the bacteria do the work uh, for us. This is the recombinant DNA uh, technology. There are also other uses, maybe less known and maybe less obvious. We use, uh, for example, biofertilizers, especially created by, uh, by fungi. This is quite common, actually, without even uh, knowing it. You can buy those tiny little sticks that we use for home plants, for pot plants, and they, are, they are contain uh, fungi or, or substances created by fungi. There are also some ideas to um, produce natural colors. And uh, these are so-called biopigments used that can be used to, um, uh, to for example, uh, add colors to, to, to clothing. And um, microbial pigments can be an important source of these natural, natural uh, colors. And also, those colors would have um, um, some medical, uh, medical properties. Uh, they produce colors that look like this, but these are their, um, they, their, their chemical formulas like astaxanthin uh, or prodigiosine. They're responsible for different uh, colors. So this is basically the industrial micro, microbiology, uh, which means that we're uh, using, manipulating microorganisms for the benefit of society and for the environment, the industry. So about the, the industry, because we are talking about some agricultural uh, uses, fertilizers, maybe pigments, food, uh, medicine. But what about something that is more associated with the idea of industry, like replacing fossil fuels, like producing fuels? Uh, and it is uh, an actual process. Um, bio biofuels are generally produced from biomass. There are various plants that are used as a source of biomass, and then the fuel is produced from them. And microbes are used in two ways in this process of, uh, of replacing fossil fuels. Um, for, when we are producing fuels from plants, as usual, microbes are searching for sugar. This is their food. They're searching for sugar. So they're searching for sugar in the, uh, uh, in the plant. Uh, and for example, we have, some, uh, we have this fungus. And fungus is a common soil fungus, trichoderma. It's nothing rare. And it produces lots of enzyme. An enzyme is called cellulose, and it gets into cells of plants. It breaks the cell, uh, um, cellulose down into sugars because they are searching for sugars. So there is, but thanks to that, the, um, um, the, uh, the breakdown of cells is, is faster. So microbes, in this case, help us get more fuel from plants faster. But actually, there are some bacteria that are modified to produce fuels by themselves without any plants, because the production of um, fuels from biomass has, um, on one hand, it helps us to, um, to, to save fossil fuels is, and is maybe more environment friendly, but there are some, also some like uh, moral dilemma, we might say, because if we use some land to produce um, this biofuel that we burn later in a way, is it moral when there is there are still problems with with good soil and, and with hunger around the world? So is it shouldn't we rather um, make effort to make everyone have food rather than fuel? So there is some moral dilemma. But in the second case, when bacteria modified bacteria produce fuel, there is no such dilemma. Actually, uh, it's a very uh, common bacteria, Escherichia coli. 
And Escherichia coli is one of the most commonly used bacteria in those old microbial uh, factories. Uh, it looks like this. I will show you the actual image uh, later. This is just, this is just a scheme. Uh, and it is one of the oldest of microorganisms, Escherichia coli, uh, and, but there is an older one here, also involved in the process. And this, this is cyanobacteria. Uh, cyanobacteria is, um, is another type of, uh, of microorganism, uh, and actually, they are combined together, they can produce fuels. How does it work? So again, we take some genes from cyanobacteria, two genes actually, uh, actually, that they encode some enzymes that turn fatty acid into fuels fuel like alkanes, alkenes. So we take those genes from cyanobacteria and we introduce them to bacteria, Escherichia coli. We give them some glucose, some sugar, because Escherichia coli um, loves sugar, like all the bacteria, and then there is some product thanks to this gene. And this product is not insulin this time. This time it's like a diesel-like fuel. It doesn't need any further chemical uh, conversions. It's quite clean. So we might say it's a perfect solution. It's, uh, there is a problem with large-scale production, but I think that we are going to solve it soon. So uh, bacteria, giant farms of bacteria, will provide us with fuel. Uh, and another, uh, another way of using microbes is biomining and a part of it that is called biology. So what is biomining? Uh, we using natural processes that would still naturally occur uh, in, uh, in nature and we speed them up a little bit. So how do we get metals like copper, like gold, uh, like zinc? Well, there are some ores, and we need to extract them from ores. How do we do this? Well, usually you need to use some chemical um, and quite dangerous uh, substances. And this is dangerous for, this, uh, for the environment, lots of waste products, uh, water is contaminated, and so on. But when the, uh, when the ore, when the, when the rock is left normally, then uh, the bacteria with time, with millions of years, will still do the work and extract it from, from, the, uh, from the rock. We extract what we're interested in, like gold or copper. But we cannot wait millions of years. We need results now and fast. So we are speeding up the process uh, a, little, a little bit. So there are some, we're using naturally occurring microbial communities. And uh, for now, it's st still a, not a, such a small part of mining industry. For the gold um, extraction, it's 5%. For the uh, copper, it's 20%. Also nickel, tin, cobalt, and what is more interesting, rare earth elements, like uranium, crucial for nuclear uh, plants. So uh, we're not using any when uh, any uh, nasty chemicals, so it's not only cost effective but also environmentally friendly. And another interesting aspect, we could also use it on on other planets. So bring um, bring the uh, bacteria there, microbes there, and extract materials that we're interested in. Maybe rare materials, maybe totally new materials. From, from there and bring them here. So this is an interesting uh, point of view as well. So we're, thanks to biomining, we're getting metal from ore, but also for, from some waste, like old mobile phones, like hard drives, like uh, any types of uh, equipment, of tools that include those metals, those very rare and very valuable metals. So uh, this, this is where also 
um, biomining is used for. This is a um, scheme showing the, the, how the process go on. So uh, there are two mechanisms, so uh, oxidation and, and, uh, and reduction. Uh, this is the main hero uh, of biomining, Thebacillus peroxidans. Uh, and I mentioned before that in some cases there's uh, bacteria like extreme uh, environments, hot springs, volcanoes, volcanic area, areas where it's hot, when it's very acidic. They like this kind of uh, extreme uh, environment. Uh, so the modern era of biomining began with this discovery of the properties of this bacterium Thebacillus peroxidans. Looks quite modest, but still it's like a perfect uh, miner. Uh, as for bioleaching, it's sort of a, another speed up of, of biomining um, uh, process. So many bacteria love reducing, love reducing um, iron, uh, rot producing mangan uh, so these kinds of microbes can be used to leach to suck the this uh, ferric iron on the mangan metals from like soils from sediments uh, also from waste because it's also um, very often used like this that we have this um wasteland after a mine, and there is no way to uh, get any more metal from it in a traditional way. But with bioleaching, we, we can still get more of the product that we're uh, interested in. So it's also environmentally uh, friendly. You can see some microorganisms involved in this bioleaching bacteria, but also some sort of fungi. Aspergillus, Aspergillus niger is also used. Aspergillus niger is uh, actually uh, the thing that sometimes grows on um, old uh, rotten uh, food. So this, this is the one. And penicillinium, but another type of penicillinium. So both fungi and um, bacteria are involved. So once again, there, why, why is it worth to use them? They're not only in for biomining, but also for any other uh, industrial use. So they're renewable and they grow really fast. There's mostly no toxic waste, unlike in traditional way of mining. They can be also used to clean up the environment, actually, uh, by reversing a flow of carbon. That means that they uh, absorb carbon and turn it into a product. It's a very efficient use of resources, uh, as I mentioned. And here is um, Escherichia coli. Escherichia coli uh, is a very unusual bacteria. Why? Because it's very dangerous for human health. If uh, water is contaminated with Escherichia coli, then water is dangerous and can kill a lot of people. Uh, it's actually that we can find in our poop. But on the other hand, uh, it's so um, flexible and uh, easy to operate that it is used in many of those uh, of, of those processes. And just to end with uh, some ideas that might seem like science fiction for now, but actually they're turning, they're, they're becoming a part of our everyday routine without us even noticing. So, and now, so other types of use of microbes. The, uh, the machine you see here is a prototype of so-called Fludoc. Uh, so it contains bacteria that glows. It shows you if you have influenza, for example. So it's like a, a one-click doctor uh, and a very fast uh, health test, maybe. They can be used for other health tests as well. Um, this is a very interesting one. I, uh, I recommend you to read more about this. There is a specially engineered, so modified bacteria uh, that is um, introduced into pigeons. It is totally harmless for, for them, but it changes a very important aspect. So, as you know, pigeons 
uh, li especially in cities, leave a lot of poop, leave a lot of excrement, and they destroy uh, buildings sometimes. And well, they are just not that pleasant. But this bacterium changes pigeon poop into biological soap. So the pigeons would literally clean the city in instead of making it dirty. Uh, another, there are some other ideas like turning bacteria into tiny spaceships, but not going to space, but going through to, to our organism and healing us, like going inside the cell, going inside a tumor, um, and and healing from the inside. Uh, there are also some research about producing biodegradable plastics, textiles, but also to producing. Uh, those plastic, but also cleaning up plastic, like using um, bacteria or other types of uh, microbes to clean up waste. So fungi and bacteria just eat plastic waste, so they would probably, hopefully, save us from this plastic catastrophe. Uh, this Aspergillus uh, tubingensis here is a very common fungus, nothing very exotic. It lives in soil and it can break plastic waste down. So uh, it's a very important uh, direction of research in microbiology. So this is it for me. Thank you very much for today.